Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance uh, YouTube channel and Conscious Resistance uh, uh, website. So today we have uh, Nima Vidati, who's a Persian conscious rapper. Um, I had him on a, a few months ago, and I just had to get him back because there's too much, good, too many good things to talk about <laughs> that we missed out. Um, he's made a, a wonderful video uh, music video called um, a gun for everyone and and then another one with mason moore uh see my chains and, and hopefully we'll get into uh his experience in anarchopulco the uh the wonderful love fest of anarchists and volunteers so <laughs> looking for <laughs> looking that's forward. right that, that's a good word for it yeah <laughs> yeah um so uh so Nima, yeah so so um <clears throat> maybe we'll get into um uh the gun the guns for everyone so so why don't you uh tell us how you know the the premise of the of the that video. That's Gun for everyone. I, I I guess I should start with how it started. It was right after the um, the Connecticut school shooting. What did they call that one? Sandy Hook. Yeah, that's right. And everybody was going nuts in the blogosphere, at least on the left, about how you know this is the last straw. We need to make sure no one has guns, and the cops need to get involved in this, and uh, all this awful stuff. And um, I was just like, man, you guys are totally taking it the wrong way. What needs to happen is, since a gun is power, it needs to be as dispersed as possible. And that's what we're all about when we talk about libertarianism or anarchism. That's kind of the idea, is that each of us is an individual. We're all the same. We're all in the same moral playing field. So no one person or group should have power over the others. So... I have a line, you know, a gun is power, so why limit its dispersal? And so I was like, we need a song like that. We need a song where it's plain and simple, and it's got a little bit of what me and uh, Michael W. Dean of the Freedom Fiends used to call, and I guess he still calls it, macho libertarian flash. You know, just out there. A gun for everyone, right? I mean, because everybody's like, no, you shouldn't let the crazy people get guns, and you shouldn't let this person get guns. And I was like, well, you know, the, the exceptions are so minute that they can be disregarded for the sake of the song. So that's the chorus is, you know, we need a, a Glock for every jock, a firearm for every mom, a gap for every girl, a sig for every kid. We need to arm the world except for government. Because yeah. that's it, right? I mean, that when you think of when guns are used horribly, uh, the most prevalent example, especially even these days in mainstream media that, that you see, if you're just paying any attention at all, is cops. It's the government using their guns uh, wantonly and just... Um, almost as a first resort. There's that recent video that went viral of the cop showing up in Dallas, knocks on this house. He was called to help a mentally unstable man, called to help instead of helping. As soon as he sees him, it literally took six seconds. He starts shooting. Black guy, of course, and just offs him. You know? and, mm -hmm. and that's what we don't need. But what we do need is for the average person to at least have the opportunity to be armed. That way he can protect himself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes sense, definitely. And uh, the people who advocate for gun control, it's kind of interesting that they don't take into account that the that the uh, the people who are enforcing gun control have all the guns, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, the, the other thing is, it's it's something we think of as living on the left, right? That's where we when we tend to think of gun control. Mm -hmm. But what they don't seem to get is that the people who are um, vastly more proportionally hurt by things like that are poor people, specifically poor black people. I mean, the people who get gun charges are people in the ghetto who have the guns, who, who probably need a gun more than you, Billy Bob, or you uh, at your wine parties in San Francisco uh, donating to your local Nancy Pelosi fund. I mean, those kind of people maybe don't need guns as much as uh, somebody in the ghetto who needs a gun. But that's the person who needs it more than you who's going to get thrown in jail because of your gun control law. It's not the Republican that, that Nancy Pelosi wants to see in jail that gets actually thrown in jail. It's probably the black person that she pretends she's helping out. Yeah, and then the, uh, <laughs> the politicians, you know, especially the president who rail against guns and gun violence, you know, themselves are... Uh, Surrounded by, you know, like, what, 20 bodyguards fully armed <laughs> to the teeth. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you I, shouldn't I, have I, a gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's okay for them. And that, that's what it all boils down to, too. And that's what we all talk about when we're voluntarists or anarchists is that that's not very fair. Is it? And that's the thing we hate most, I think. And that's the thing I hate. One of the things I hate the most is, is the hypocrisy of both 
the major political threads in our society and how they're completely inconsistent. And that's kind of what draws, I think, a lot of us who are more logical thinking and need to have a coherent um, intellectual system or at least uh, a coherent set of values to follow um, is the fact that anarchy just is across the board. It's uh, the same for everyone. You know, I have the same rights and responsibilities as the richest and the poorest of society. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, people think like gun-free zone, you know, school's a gun-free zone. Or I, I saw some uh, a picture of a, a house, you know, this is a gun-free house. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what, what greater of an invitation for, you know, a, a, a thief or just a madman, you know, to yeah. come. And- it really makes me wonder if those are Photoshop or fake or what, because who would do that, man, really? And and if you look at the stats, I mean, it's clearly borne out that, um, you know, in places like England and Australia where they have disarmed, you know, just recently in like the past couple of decades, mm-hmm. um, you know, most burglaries I've read happen when people are home because it's not really a concern anymore for the burglars to, oh, somebody might have a gun. They, they don't tend to think that most people have a gun in their home. Here in Texas, <laughs> that's not the case. Uh, people don't run up in houses like they do in, in gun control places uh, in overseas or in America, you know, places like Illinois. Mm-hmm. Here in Texas, you're not going to run into a house. You're going to try to make sure if you're a thief that, that nobody's home because you don't know what kind of AR, AK, uh, Mossberg 512 gauge somebody's got there yeah, yeah, behind yeah. them. They could have anything. Yeah. yeah and the other, the other uh, concept is um, even, you know, regardless, like, like, you know, people say Sandy Hook is a hoax, right? And, you know, I mean, I don't even know if it is or it isn't. I mean, but I think that's besides the point. Like, e- even if it was not, and if it was, uh, you know, a real thing, people died and everything, still the idea of, because that happened, we need to punish all of society and disarm right. everyone. Is such a uh, arcane notion, you know, and that's what laws are. You know, one, you know, a few idiotic people, you know, all of a sudden they, you know, they they think that they gotta, you know, s- scribble some mandates and edicts, and you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's kin- it's kindergarten mentality, but really that's just what they how they sell it. You know, mm-hmm. I really don't think they care about everybody. The people who make the laws, mm-hmm. they just want to look like they're doing something. They're just responding to uh, whatever they think is going to get them votes. They're just saying what they think people want to hear, and some people want to hear that because some people don't think far ahead enough to realize that the overbearing giant government full of regulations on what you can own, because in the end, that's really the basis I attack uh, a lot of gun legislation on, is the fact that how are you going to, if if you make that slippery slope to where you get to decide what somebody can or can't buy, first of all, it's not going to work, because as we see, black markets don't actually prevent people from getting the things. It just makes it more dangerous to get the things. And it just makes it to where the more criminal elements will be the ones dealing it or getting it. I mean, you look at this in the war on drugs. And this is why I don't get why the left thinks that the war on guns could work. Because they obviously see how horribly the war on drugs has failed. Mm-hmm. So, in the end, the government shouldn't decide uh, for anybody what kind of property they own. Whether it be a piece of metal that we call a gun that's just configured in a way to where it can hit uh, a cartridge and launch a bullet, or if it's a bong, or if it's a sack of weed, or a brick of coke, or whatever it is. There's no uh, legitimate legal conception that I can see or justification for some group telling another individual or another group of people what they can and can't buy, own, or sell. Yeah, yeah and I, I get the argument from my family, especially, you know, guns. The only function they have is to kill people. Why would you ever want to? Why does anybody need a machine gun? You know why? There's just no reason. I'm like, and and the way I look at it, I'm like a gun, it's just like you know a lawnmower, a shovel, you know, yeah, a chainsaw, yep. a car. Like these are these are tools. These are you know uh, pieces of machines, technology that we use to enhance our lives, to make our lives easier. And sure, all of those things can kill people. <laughs> you know, we put in the hands of a of a madman, right? How many people right. can you kill with in a car if you really wanted to? Like, just go on the sidewalk. You know, it's just like. But and and then and then basically, you know, I I read this one meme is saying uh, they're like, um, why do you need to own a gun? And and they're like, well, are you afraid of 
of uh, driving your car that you can hit somebody? Like, no, why? Because they're learning how to drive. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. You learn how to use a gun. Yeah. There's a there's a book I have now. That, I mean, now that I have kids, I bought it. It's, it's by a guy named Assad Ayub, who's actually really good on guns, and he writes a lot of um, books to that effect. Even though he's a former cop. You kind of got to give him a pass when he when when he's talking about this specific issue, and he's got a book called "Gun Proof Your Kids" or "Gun Proof Your Children" or something like that. And the whole point is, uh, what you really want to do is work on the person. Your kid is a human being, and he's going to grow up to be a human being. Make sure he's not the kind of person that's going to be reckless, neglectful, dangerous with a gun, either with malice or with neglect, make sure your kid is not going to grow up to be that person. That's the main thing. Because in the end, if somebody's the kind of person that's going to be neglectful with a gun, they're also the kind of person that's going to be neglectful with, like you say, a car or prescription medication or household cleaners or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if they're the kind of person that's going to be malicious and violent with a the gun, then they're the same kind of person that's going to be malicious or violent with a knife or a car or household chemicals or explosives or gasoline. You know, it's not the thing. It's not the thing. It's the person. That's that's one of the lines in a gun for everyone. Don't blame the thing. Blame the person. Yeah, yeah. Blame the ina- inanimate object, right? That's the one that kills people <laughs> is the inanimate object. I think I, I remember reading uh, Jeff Berwick wrote an article a while ago saying how in England they, they banned knives. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, what's yeah. next? Hammers? Like, what, what do you... <laughs> where, where is the screwdrivers? Like, what? <laughs> you know, be, right. I, I think I also I saw also another, another meme showing how how many people die as a result of like um, you know just fists like combat and baseball bats and and it's like much more with those than with guns. <laughs> like people, oh, yeah. if people really want to kill somebody, they're gonna find a way, right? Right, right. Well, there's one. Uh, you know, if you're gonna blame things, blame hospitals, right? Where do most people die? They die in the hospital. Yeah. So if we're gonna be that silly and yeah. take it to argument ad absurdum, uh, let's ban hospital beds because that's where most people die. <laughs> yeah, right. it, it, it's just ridiculous. And you know what? Uh, I just kind of thought of this, but maybe it goes to the point that you know a lot of um, Austrian economics is based on the axiom that that man acts, right? Praxeology, and that humans actually they make decisions and they base those on costs. And obviously, whatever they're acting on now, whatever they're dispensing with now, they value more than the other things. The left and the left word economists don't really have that concept of cost. You know, they think the government can spend infinitely. They think the spending is the action. They don't really think of, of things like that. They don't have any theory of costs. So maybe that's why in the end they don't understand property and they don't understand that people are the root of it because they don't understand that people act. They think for some reason the objects act. <laughs> they think the money acts or the job acts or the gun acts. Yeah. They don't understand that it's the man or the woman or the child or the mm-hmm. or the person who acts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When people, you know, blame money for, for a lot of the problems. It's money. It's it's pieces of paper, that's the evil, or it's pieces <laughs> of gold, or it's just, you know, wanting I mean it's like yeah, you're right. It's people. The way people are raised, you know, yeah. principles and morals and how they're, you know, spanked or not, or, you know, shoved in Shoved in government schools and you know forced right. to learn ridiculous minutia, you know regurgitated right. back. <laughs> right. Yeah. In the end, it's always a decision, and you know that's that's what it comes to. And you shouldn't be the kind of person that can uh, that could think to use a gun violently to kill somebody uh, in the first place. And if you are, then you have much bigger problems <laughs> that you need to deal with mm-hmm. than uh, than what you have in your glove box. You need to work on yourself. I w- because in the end, no matter how how hard society tries to keep you from getting a gun to hurt somebody. If you're the kind of person who has that hurt and that hate in your heart, Mm -hmm. you're going to try to figure out a way to enact it on whoever it is. Mm -hmm. And you don't need a gun to be extremely hurtful, especially around children. I mean, these are the kind of people that end up hurting young people and and child rapists and things like that. So Mm -hmm. what we really need to be doing is focusing on all of our moral health, you know, not just mental health, but all of our sense of, personal responsibility to our fellow humans mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh, a related topic um, I was talking with a family member about um, is the absurdity of laws you know most laws either are uh, redundant like you know killing is legal <laughs> or <laughs> completely ridiculous and pointless like a speed limit you know like yeah. you know I say uh, I say what's the purpose of the speed limit they're like well it, it it makes sure people don't drive fast. All right. Does that mean that nobody violates the speed limit? No. Most people <laughs> drive faster than the speed limit. All right. So then what's uh-huh. the use of the speed limit? Well, if it's 55, most people drive 65. It's going to deter the guy driving 85. I'm like, all right. So the guy drives 85. Obviously, he doesn't care about a ticket. And he doesn't even care about his own life if he's being reckless. So what do you mm-hmm. think What do you think the law is going to do? Like, what's the purpose of the law? 
<laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we all know the real answer, though. <laughs> it's to, to, it's revenue generation, yeah, yeah, right? The so they yeah. can write you a ticket. Exactly. And, um, I think John Oliver did a piece. I didn't get to watch it all, but I watched like the first two minutes about. And I'm so glad that somebody so mainstream is doing that. He also did. Uh, you know who he is, right, John? Yeah, uh, the, the, the comedian guy, right? Yeah, yeah. He used to be on the Daily Show. I, I hope it's John Oliver. Yeah, I think that's his name. Yeah. He um he did one on. Uh, Asset, civil asset forfeiture. Yeah, that, that, that was, was huge, yeah. and you know that's that's an issue usually only libertarians talk about. Yeah, now, exactly. now everybody was talking about, it. and now he did a bit about um, uh, municipal violations, things like speeding tickets and parking tickets and mm. mundane crap that we all pay. Mm. And uh, his thesis, I, like I said, it's seventeen minute long thing. I only mm. got to see it up till his thesis, mm. where it's basically you know if you don't have money. This kind of stuff ruins your life. Mm -hmm. It's not just a nuisance. I mean, if you're making minimum wage, it'll take you a whole week to pay off a traffic ticket, a whole week of your life, of your labor, to pay off a traffic ticket. And some people don't have that to spare. Mm -hmm. And then they get a warrant, and then it piles up. I know here in Texas, if you don't pay it, it doubles. Then you get a warrant, mm -hmm. and you get thrown in jail, and then you don't work. Mm -hmm. And then you're in the system, and then you have to be on parole. <laughs> um, you know, And there's, there's this whole industries of the parasites that just feed off of us like this. Uh, a study just came out that, um, so Ferguson, right? The Mike Brown death where Mike Brown got shot to death by the cop. Yeah. Um, however you feel about that, whatever. I, we, won't, we don't even have to go into that to think about how horrible it is in Ferguson because all you have to realize is that there's about 20,000 people. That's the, the on the books population of Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many of those people had warrants? Six, 16,000. Oh, <laughs> really? it, it's basically just a big farm for cops to harass people and get money out of them. That's yeah. basically all, the, all that they were treating that whole disadvantaged population as a cash cow for them under the color of quote unquote law. So yeah, exactly. When you say laws are ridiculous, that's one perfect example of it. Yeah, and actually, uh, that reminds me of another conversation I got into. Of uh, you know, I was talking to another family member, and she was talking about racism and how the government is so wonderful because it did away with slavery, and uh, ah. you know, we're not racist anymore because of laws. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. right. And, and then she was like, "You see how society has improved? You know, we, you know, we don't have segregated restaurants and gas stations. You know, it's integrated." I'm like. I'm like, yeah, because it's law. It's called integration. Like there was forced segregation. Now there's forced integration. It's just as bad. It's you know, it's always forced. Like you know, it's completely infringes on you know freedom of association uh, of business owners, right? How, how they want to run their own business, you know. So we don't, we have no idea how they would run because it was law both ways, segregated, segregated and integrated. <laughs> right. In, you know? Yeah, that's a, that's such an important point. Is that slavery couldn't have existed in the absence of the state yeah, yeah. in the first place. If there were no sheriff's deputies to catch the runaway slaves and return them, mm -hmm. they would have all ran away. You think they can't uh, outrun Massa? They would have all gotten away. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and if they could have armed themselves as well. But some of the first gun control was to prevent uh, the black population from arming themselves mm -hmm. and protecting themselves. Um, so the racism was a function of the state in the first place. So you can't use the fact that the state did away with it in its own terms as a, as an example of something great they did because they they started it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if if you if you didn't shower for like three years and then you you took a shower, you don't get credit about how clean you are. You just joined the rest of civilized society. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and the other thing, so so she was saying, you know, we, we see how society has improved. I'm like, like you sure society has improved? You're saying there's, you know, the, uh, is war a new thing? Is or invasions a new thing? Assassinations a new thing? <laughs> you know, sure the technology has improved, but you know, you know, subjugation, domination, ta taxation, this is nothing new. <laughs> this existed for for hundreds, you know, if not thousands of years, right? So you know, the world really has improved, but not because of the state. Not you know? because, yeah, exactly. It, completely in spite of it. I mean, and like you say, it's the technology that yeah. that really pushes us forward. And I think it's in the end, it's the tech that helps us to to integrate more than the state could uh, along racial and geographic lines. I mean. People play together their their games online. You know their mm. 
Minecraft or uh, whatever war games people are playing now on their Xboxes and their PS4s. Um, you don't care. You can't even really see the color. You might be able to say you can hear it, but uh, and people might get into their little uh, silly fights about uh, using racist terms against each other, but they're not really going to hurt each other. They're not really going to be disadvantageous to each other and keep each other from getting jobs or things like that. And you know, when it's e-commerce, you don't care about anything but the color green or or whatever kind of money you're getting. And you know, it's the market that ends up having people go into underserved communities and end up serving them. And it's the market that has people opening their doors to w anybody who's willing to pay them. You know, and The market sorts all that out. If you're going to discriminate against the whole population of people, that's a whole truckload of money you're <laughs> foregoing. And so in the end, people rather have, I think, most people the money. And, and th those who don't, that's fine. Let them be boycotted or let them fail to be as prominent of a business as the ones that accept all comers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, I mean, that's one of the things I mentioned was, you know, what, what, what's the problem with the business that decides they only want to uh, service white people, right? They don't want to serve black people, Asian people, anybody else. You know, she's like, how can you say that? That's immoral. That's horrible. It should be a law. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, they're hurting themselves. They're, yeah, they're, exactly. they're, they're restricting their, you know, their patronage, their, you know, their revenue to a certain small segment of the population. And, right. you know, I think most people are not racist. And so therefore word will spread, you know, just like, you know, people talk all the time, you know, people get ratings, you know, like on, uh, on Amazon, yeah, you know, you know, uh, sellers get ratings. So, you know, word spreads yep. about people's reputations. <laughs> it really does, and it's yeah. a great it's a great example of the difference between natural law or customary law or a social, anarchic social order, whatever you term or phrase you want to use to describe it, mm -hmm. as being opposed to what I call man made law or government law or state law. Um, because you know, in the end, the punishment usually immediately follows. Uh, the the action if it's bad. So like you say, if if you end up discriminating, it's words going to get around. You're going to lose business. Um, and you know if you end up poisoning the food, you know that's a, another big thing. States always bring up. Well, what if the food? Is there's no government. They all the food would be poisoned. We'd all we'd we'd all die. And. <laughs> No, man. First of all, the state doesn't solve that problem. I mean, we have we have all these outbreaks of salmonella and listeria, even with the FDA. Yeah. You know, they they don't stop it. Yeah. Um, what really keeps companies from making sure their food is healthy, uh, or at least not poisoned. Is is the fact that they don't want to kill their revenue stream? <laughs> All right. Why are you going to kill the people that pay you every week or every day or every month? That's right. retarded. Right. It's bad. It's bad business. Right. Um, it's like it's like a bit Doug Stanhope does about how how silly sin laws are, you know, um, or vice laws, I guess they're called, mm -hmm. uh, because the punishment is in the vice itself. If you're an <laughs> alcoholic, if you binge drink, you're gonna ha wake up with a hangover. You're gonna puke all over the place. You're gonna end up with psoriasis of the liver. You're gonna die early. The yeah. punishment is in the action so you can respond to the negative pressure from the natural result of your actions mm -hmm. uh, which is what people should do or you can continue to do it and face the inevitable consequences um, same thing with with all drugs same thing with being reckless in general or being violent you know if you're a violent person you live by the sword you die by the sword so if you go out picking fights and pulling knives on people, mm -hmm. somebody's going to get you or yeah. somebody's going to beat the crap out of you. The, the, the negative consequences is inherent in the way human society and nature interacts with you in the first place. So why do we need to have this state to, to make sure it all gets sorted out? A, we don't. B, it causes more violence and hurt and theft than if we didn't have a state. Yeah, well said, well said. So maybe we should uh, segue into your uh, See My Chains uh, video. So why don't you uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Ah, yeah. Well, we're talking about the change now, aren't we? Well, oh, that, yeah. that's exactly the thing, man. And, and that's what made me want to start it, uh, start that song and, and, and see it through is um, we, we, in the end... Uh, are slaves in a lot of ways. You know, we're slaves. Just if you look at the numbers of how much we end up paying in various taxes, and and you know, I like to include all taxes. It's not just income tax. Um, it's every time any state actor or government sticks you for your wallet. It's your income tax. It's your social security that gets taken from you, and it doesn't go into some kind of savings fund. You know, that goes into the slush fund, and they spend it. Um, and they have to steal from other people when they're supposedly going to pay you your social security. It's the sales tax. And then it's all the consequence of all the taxes everybody else has to pay. Um, you know, the fact that, that think about how cheap your consumer goods or your food would be if every step of production didn't get taxed. 
It's all this extra money. So we're, we're in the end, there's, there's many months or weeks we work every year where we're completely slaves. So that's one point. Um, the other point is how we are forced through threat of death and punishment into doing these, like you said, these man-made laws, these, these silly things that, that the state enforces on, on us, is, is basically at the threat of the same thing the slaves were threatened with, with beatings and death. You know, the cops come, and if you keep resisting, they're going to throw you to the ground. They're going to put you in a chokehold. Hopefully it doesn't kill you like it did Eric Garner, or they're going to shoot you if you resist enough. Um, so in the end, we're, we're that way too, to where Massa gets to decide whether we live or die. Our ass is his. It's not ours. Um, you know, it shouldn't be that way. And, uh, and so I kind of wanted to segue that. It's kind of like a long, drawn-out metaphor. Because in the end, the, the um, not the revelation, but the redemption in the third act is, uh, is Bitcoin. Or really blockchain technology, sort of cryptocurrency in general. And whether it ends up being Bitcoin as it manifests now... Uh, or some kind of other blockchain 2.0 technology, the idea that we can bypass this, that we can have um, a system of uh, peer-to-peer exchange or record keeping that takes trusting a hierarchical structure out of the equation. And that's the way to break our chains. So first we have to see the chain, the fact that we are slaves in a lot of ways. And it's not a matter of, it's not a difference between kind. We actually are slaves. It's just a difference of degree. So we actually are more like a free-range slave populace, whereas you know uh, the African slaves of yore were more of a, um, uh, a hard slavery. You know now it's more of a soft slavery. But we still have to see that the chains exist. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the problem. You know, I think if people when when you use the word slave, it's like you know they only think of you know the the black African who came over here against his will and just you know chains around his ankles and his and his and his wrists and his neck and. And that's what they think about, right? And and uh, you're like, how can you say it? How can you say we're slaves? I can go anywhere. I can go to the store. I can go to the bank. I, can, I go to work. I can choose where I want to work. How can you call me a slave? <laughs> but uh, I think uh, it's easy to ignore uh, the restrictions because most of us have grown up in this in this society, and so we yeah. have in you know it, it's become part of us in a sense, you know, and we can't really imagine like like. How would we have become if I didn't spend 12 years of my life in government school, you right. know? or if I didn't have a third of my uh, if a, a third of my paycheck robbed every year? How much wealthier would we all have been? You know, so it's hard for people to have that kind of imagination, right? It really is. Yeah, and I think I think one of the terms people use for that is status quo bias. And if it's something you see every day, you get used to it. And, and, and if you feel generally happy about your life, you're probably, you probably think you're okay. And you, you associate your life with all the things we associate as being good, like freedom. Um, somebody wrote a book in, uh, after World War II you know, because they saw Germany destroy itself through fascism and destroy so much of Western civilization through fascism. And they wondered, how could this be? The Germans were some of the most technologically advanced people the world had ever seen. They were productive. They were hardworking. They were intelligent. They were artistic. I mean, think about Beethoven and Mozart. Uh, you know, great, great artistry, great technology. How could they be taken in by such a charlatan as Hitler? And, you know, it was, it was all propaganda. It was, it, the book was called They Thought They Were Free. And, you know, at the time, they didn't realize what was happening to them because, hey, they lived there and this is what everybody else was doing, you know, and it just kind of kind of happened, you know, the boiling frog cliche. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh, one of Larkin Rose's past videos uh, called um, What's So Bad About the Nazis? Um, <laughs> just comparing, comparing Nazi Germany to the present day federal government. And what is the difference? You know, why are they so bad? Why do we consider them the epitome of evil? And uh, and we are you know saints and God and angels and and all is good <laughs> you know right. and um, and you know what I, I think most people would say oh they kill people oh okay so United States United States military never kill people oh okay you know what about you know just just list all the genocides that the you know federal government has right uh, <laughs> right so it, it, it's really if you take a step back from all the propaganda you know it's like wait a minute we aren't really that different right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't think so. And, you know, the reign of the United States empire has gone on way longer. And they actually did end up ruling the world. You know, Hitler was stopped. Yeah. Uh, the Nazis didn't get much further than Europe. I mean, they didn't get any eastward of, uh, of Russia, um, you know, whereas the American empire 
spans pretty much all the way up to Russia. You know, al almost all of Ukraine now, at least half of Ukraine, the western half of Ukraine is pretty much in the influence of the American Empire. Um, you know, and all the way up to Japan on the other side of the world. <laughs> you know, there's a few holdouts. There's Russia, there's Iran. Um, there's the Islamic State, uh, there's some South American and Latin American countries that don't completely play ball, um, but most of the rest of the world has United States military bases in it and cooperate, and their dictators are paid stooges of Washington, D.C., so uh, there's that. Yeah, but, you know, we can just forget about them. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't matter, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah, people don't like to think about that. Well, you know, I, I think that's one of the reasons Nazi is so important. Nazi Germany is such an important, it's a foundational myth, right? So if, if they paint it in the propaganda as this was the world's greatest evil, we were opposed to it, then by default, because of humans' natural way of thinking in that kind of dualistic way of, you know, there's light and dark, there's good, there's evil, yeah. uh, it's the default then that Americans must be good, right? Because yeah. Hitler was evil and we fought Hitler. Therefore, we are good. We won. So, good won the day, and now we continue to be good. So that's sort of how how the modern America emerged in this in the narrative is is America came out, they defeated Hitler, and had uh, benevolent global hegemony ever since. And anybody who challenges us must be Hitler or like Hitler because they're challenging America who defeated Hitler. And that's I think one of the reasons why whenever they want to go invade a country, they always try to compare the leader of that country in some way to Hitler. You know, Saddam was Hitler, Gaddafi was Hitler, Noriega I think was Hitler. Like they, they have really low standards for how, how big you have to be to be a Hitler now. And, and what's interesting also is that um, you know Hitler wasn't uh, he wasn't number one in, in the in the in the numbers of uh, you know uh, genocide mass murders by by far at all. He was It was like, probably Joseph Stalin who yeah, was our ally Stalin World and, Prince, right? Stalin and Mao like were like like whoo many, many magnitudes worse. Yet you don't really hear about that in your government schooling history class, um, because you know I think the, the U.S. was allied with with uh, with Russia, right? Stalin. <laughs> oh yeah, they call oh, him yeah. Uh, Uncle Joe, right? F FDR loved him. Yeah, yeah. Uncle Joe. Um, there was some stories I was reading about how uh, um, he actually seemed to like. Uh, Stalin better than he liked uh, Churchill from England. Like he, th they, they were more buddy buddy than than Winston Churchill and FDR were. Yeah. Uh, and it, w it would piss Churchill off. So yeah, and if you look at the New Deal, it was pretty fascist. You know, it was pretty commie, and it was pretty much taking a lot of the industries and nationalizing them. FDR confiscated gold because he wanted uh, you know federal government monetary policy to be able to have free reign to control people's pocketbooks. Um, a lot of the horrible things we think about as being unfree and communist, FDR was all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, he made the forty-hour strict work week. He, uh, you know, the uh, <clears throat> the forced internment of the uh, Japanese Americans, German Americans, right. Italian Americans. The yeah, <laughs> the, I forgot yeah. about that. Yes, and he had concentration camps concentration. just like Hitler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah confis uh, he got. Uh, I saw a couple of great memes like. Uh, if you like your gold, you can keep your gold. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Like if you like your doctor, you can yeah. Keep your doctor. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it, yeah, it reminds me of uh, Lou Rockwell's law. They call it where uh, anytime the government says something, believe the exact opposite of yeah, it. Basically, they're definitely. pretty much lying every time they open their mouths. Pretty much. I mean, uh, and people rail against Obama for all the executive orders he he has issued, which is some around two hundred, I think, but. Um, <laughs> you know, if you look at, go on, go on, you know, Google how many, uh, which president made the most executive orders? FDR by far, by far. He's like 3,500 <laughs> uh, in executive orders, which, which came out to like um, a, a little over one per day. <laughs> wow. wow. Like, like he was like, he was like uh, busy. <laughs> that guy yeah. was his executive. Yeah. I think, I think it was either Theodore Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson, too, that I think brought that into sort of the modern era of American politics. Like before, I can't remember, if it was, I think it was Theodore Roosevelt. Before him, you know, the president really didn't do a whole lot of stuff like that. And it was thought that Congress really is supposed to be the lawmaking body. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Theodore Roosevelt was like, no, basically the, the way I read the Constitution is whatever it says I can't do, I can't do. But anything else I can and will do. You know, if it doesn't say something specifically, I'm going to do it, and I have the power to. Yeah, yeah, and uh, another interesting thing is, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the, um, you know, the habeas corpus and, you know, due process of law being banished, like the NDAA, 
during times of war, right? Like this is this, right. this, this is horrible. It's unprecedented. You know, but actually, I say, actually, you know what? <clears throat> it's not unprecedented. You know, you look at look at during the wars in history during World War Two, World War One, Civil War. Yeah. habeas corpus was thrown out every single time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did, did, didn't Lincoln lock up a whole section of the Congress? <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, and there were the Alien and Sedition Acts, mm-hmm. and yeah, th- there's tons of precedent for it. <laughs> and um, you know, you, that's a really good point you bring. Is is a lot of people. Hopefully not as many libertarians anymore, and it's just the conservatives doing it now that are fooled by it. But there's a lot of people that kind of view American history with some kind of rose-colored glasses, and they think we just need to get back to some kind of good value system that we had when the country was founded. But pretty much since the Constitution, there's been wars of imperialism. There's been um, monetary policy. There's been people getting thrown in jail uh, for silly things. I mean, George Washington... Uh, in, he, he put down the whiskey rebellion. It was people rebelling against taxes on whiskey, yeah. you know, which is what you think of the Revolutionary War was fought about was a, a tax too high on tea. <laughs> yeah. And George Washington went and killed people to enforce his tax on whiskey. Um, keep in mind that he owned one of the biggest whiskey distilleries oh, in really? the area. <laughs> yeah, so it was to his benefit to make sure that the tax – hurt the lower or the marginal distillers and made him more money because he could afford, he was one of the bigger players. You know, uh, just like nowadays, you see the big companies, they don't mind the regulation and the increased taxes because they have the deep pocketbooks to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, they know it'll it'll get rid of some of the, the smaller mom and pop operations who can't afford the legal department to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting the amount of re- reverence that many people have for presidents, you know, like these are our presidents, these are the commander in chief, you know, he's the head honcho, the buck stops here. And uh, I'm like, actually, you know what? I think, I think all most presidents are mass murderers. <laughs> and you know, and yes, I, get, I yes. get interesting, interesting, uh, you know, cognitive dissonance response, like, you know, strange faces, like, what? Are you serious? How can you say that about a president? He's a brave, he's a wonderful man. You know, there's movies. Yeah, like there's a, there's a movie made about George Bush, uh, <laughs> W. Oh my God! <laughs> and then there's uh, yeah, you know, each president I think writes like a bio, um, you know, autobiography. Yeah, they have like, like they have like memoirs. Yeah, yeah, right. They all get their own libraries yeah. paid for out of taxpayers. Well, I think maybe they have have to raise money for the libraries, but either way, yeah. they have these giant churches to to their sainthood in mm-hmm. the religion of the state. Uh, pretty much every president does. Yeah, yeah. So, so I tell people, you know, like um, one of the things about about um, you know a, a huge uh, bureaucracy, a federal government, is it's a diffusion of responsibility and accountability, yes. right? Exactly. So right. when when a military, when a soldier goes overseas and you know and murders innocent women and children, um, who's to blame? You know, he just says, "Oh, you know what? I'm just doing my job." <laughs> and the guy who, who ordered him, he's like, "Well, I was just doing my job." Too. <laughs> right, and so, right. And so, who do you blame? Do you blame anybody? Do you blame everybody, right? And uh, I say, I say, everyone is to blame because everyone has free choice. We always, yes. have, we always have freedom to to say no or to comply, right? And right, um, right. And, and you know, so therefore, the blame goes all the way up to, from the president all the way down to the man who's who's doing the actual murdering. So, I'm, amen. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> important. You you put it that way. That's a really good point. Um, I think the way Scott Horton puts it is. Uh, responsibility is is a quality not a quantity so it's not this person a was 20 percent responsible and this person b was 60 percent responsible and it has to add up to a hundred uh you know another person was 20 percent responsible so it adds up no it's uh george bush was a hundred percent responsible for the the iraq war yeah. donald rumsfeld was a hundred percent responsible for the iraq war colin powell was a hundred percent they can all be responsible yeah. and then the soldier that killed the mom you know the american sniper that shot yeah. the uh the mother with her her kid holding your hand, yeah. he's 100% responsible too. They're all responsible because they all made the decision that they knew would kill somebody. Yeah. Did, did you see that movie, by the way, American Sniper? God, I, I <laughs> probably should for the sake of being a, a talker on points like this. But I don't know if I can subject myself. I don't have the mental fortitude uh, right now to do it. You know? yeah. I, I didn't see it either, but I've heard enough commentary. And read enough articles on it that I pretty much can get an idea of what it's about. I've yeah. read some portions of the book and I've read some quotes from Chris Kyle and enough to know that he was completely unapologetic mm. and and proud. And he said uh, something to the effect of his only regret was he wished he would have killed more. Oh, yeah. And the well. sense I really get from him is in the end he wasn't brave. He was a coward because he could never really face 
his own internal conscious enough to even question what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what's interesting is, you know, we have these soldiers that go overseas and they, and they do all this murder. And actually, I, when I say that, you know, soldiers are murderers, you know, I got a lot of uh, military people say, well, I didn't kill anybody. I'm like, well, did you go over there on a humanitarian mission? Were you there to, you know, feed the, feed, uh, the, the hungry and, uh, you know, build houses and churches? No, of course not. Everything you did was, you know, for invasion and occupation, and which is basically subjugation of, a, you know, people you never met, right? So, <laughs> so you're not humanitarian, so even if you didn't kill any. Even, even the guy who was, like, cleaning the drones, he had something to do <laughs> with it, right? Um, but, that's right, um, that's right. But, now, like, now there, there are some people that are completely ignorant, and I, and I think if people are faced with the truth and they're controlled, Right, and and a lot. Some people are. Some people leave the army. Uh, they leave the air force. They don't want any part of it anymore. And they become anti-war, and and they have to uh, they have to work within it with themselves, and maybe they forgive themselves eventually. Um, you know, more power to them. Um, to me, the real problem is that there's such a there's such a culture of support the troops no matter what that a lot of people never get to have that level of self awareness or self questioning to where they get to that point. Uh, they just end up thinking that, hey, I am a hero. Hey, it was okay that I murdered, you know? And they end up going through their whole life, and then they get to where they're o too old to ever really look back on it with anything but the rose-colored glasses that society has handed them. Yeah, so so the way I look at PTSD is in two ways. The first one is, you know, it's a recognition that they know what they did was morally wrong. And yeah. you, you can you can lie to yourself, right? And say it wasn't, but your subconscious and your your inner psyche cannot lie, <laughs> and, and that's like to me all the nightmarish ghouls that are haunting you for the rest of your life, because yeah. of, because of what you did, right? Yeah, um, I bet I bet there's a ton of that going on. I mean, isn't the the suicide rate such now that that more people commit suicide than are killed in combat? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's a really amazing thing. Yeah, and, and I think I think I, I read. Um, I think more people die uh, from suicide, you know, who are uh, veterans, like every day or every other day than, than, are, than were killed in the Sandy Hook shooting. <laughs> you know? Oh, wow. You know, and, and the other wow. thing is, is um, you know, people come back and they have this PTSD and they have these nightmares and insomnia, anxiety, and people are like, you know what, this is horrible, you know, we got to help the veterans, they served our country, you know, we got to give them all this stuff. But then you have to stand back and like, wait, wait, what did you do? Why are you like this? Oh, you killed a bunch of people. Oh. So <laughs> how, how can you really, you know, feel sorry for somebody who like voluntarily goes overseas to kill people and then comes back, you know what, I have a couple of nightmares, I have some insomnia, can you help me? <laughs> it's, it's a you tough know? nut to crack. You know? on, on the other hand, I can kind of see how you could make the argument that, well, they didn't know. They were fooled their whole life. A lot of these kids join up when they're 18. Their football coach told them it'd be an honorable thing. Their pastor told them it'd be an honorable thing. Their mom and dad, the government, the TV, the, the commercials in a football game told them that they'd be great yeah. heroes and yeah. they'd gain skills afterwards. And so in, to me, almost when you're doing it to a minor, you know, like if you're 17 or 18 and you're throwing a kid out there, mm -hmm. then maybe in that those kinds of cases you could say, well, hey, you know, they were kind of victims. You know, they were, they may not have been forced in the sense of a draft, mm -hmm. but you know, there's things also like the poverty draft where maybe they didn't have any options mm -hmm. because the government has run the economy into the ground so horribly. So in some cases, I, I'd say you know people could be looked at as victims, and maybe, it, but then then you have the problem of well, how do you help them in some kind of libertarian sense because that's all money that's stolen too. Um, so in the in the end, I don't know. Maybe if there were some kind of better organizations or free market charities that could kind of take on that from the point of view of we understand, we, we're glad you're contrite. We're gonna we, we want to help you out. We we want you to not be a victim. Uh, you're sorry for what you did. You know, because I think all we have now really is is um, combat veterans for peace. You know, the thing Adam mm. Kokesh used to work with, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is more of a political organization, as far as I know. It's not really a charity or a help group or anything. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's work that can be done in in the liberty space that that I haven't really seen being done yet is um, sort of an outreach program and mm -hmm. show them the ideas of liberty too. Say, hey, you know, you were you were a victim of this war machine of you were cannon fodder for the military industrial complex. Doesn't that suck? Don't you want to make sure that doesn't happen? And you know, there is uh, I forget his name, but there is a guy out there uh, who is a, a combat veteran and he does work to the effect of anti recruiting. 
So he tries to get into schools and keep kids from being fooled by the military recruiters that are in every high school pretty much in America. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there needs to be more things like that to where, A, you prevent, and B, you get the people who were victimized by the war machine and, and try to get them to see what happened and then uh, and help them through it. Because mm -hmm. in the end, I think, like, like you say, the PTSD is a lot of that cognitive dissonance of everybody says I'm a hero, I was supposed to be doing the right thing, but I can't get these images of these lifeless bodies bloodied by my hands out of my head. Mm -hmm. And maybe if they could come to some kind of terms of, oh, actually, I, I was a fool and I was lied to and I'm sorry and, and I, I pray for my eternal soul for forgiveness, then maybe they could have some kind of internal peace come about because of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy uh, solution to that. Uh, and you're right, you know, the... Um the whole, um, you know, agenda of public school, you know, you go all the way back to, uh, to the, the Prussian model in the, in the 19th century is to yeah. produce, compo uh, you know, obedient, um, compliant citizens, right? And, mo and, and, and soldiers. And, and soldiers. Yeah, that's yeah. the end product, you know. So, so having, having the recruiters come to the high school is completely understandable and logical if that's, you know, what you're doing to the, to the right. people. You're trying to break the, um, you know, the spirit of... Uh, creativity of imagination of kids yeah. and you try to just dumb them down to you know uh, <laughs> you know uh, how you say uh, Mencken said the same safe level <laughs> right. of, of citizenry right yeah yeah and, and and what for because we're always sold this bill of goods about this social contract and you know we're doing it all for the good of each other and this is why we have to have good citizens and good soldiers but that's not really who's benefiting, is it? I mean, it's it's the people at the top of the hierarchy mm -hmm. who are sending these children to die for their own, not even always their pocketbooks, because sometimes they don't profit that much, not enough to really justify massacring and genociding. Uh, I think it's this this power lust, this blood lust, mm -hmm. um, this this desire to be the conqueror. You know, we're, we're doing all this to basically stroke the, the vilest, basest desires of evil sociopaths sitting on tops of piles of skulls. There's nothing honorable or beneficial about it. And, and in the end, if we can make people see what they're doing this for and that it's not so they can have um, roads, it's not so they can have peace and order, mm -hmm. it's so the people at the top can feel powerful and feel good about themselves. It's for the benefit of a select few. Yep, yep, yep. But I mean, yeah, they're defending our freedom. Oh, defending? You mean an ocean away? They're defending our freedom by invading right. another? Oh, okay. That's uh, that's an interesting <laughs> defense. Well, that, that goes back to, to the schooling, doesn't it? Because they don't understand what an ocean is, let alone yeah, right. where where Iraq is in relation to the Atlantic Ocean from America. They're defending our freedoms from. From ISIS and ISIL that doesn't even have a navy or you know a functioning military, <laughs> they completely don't have an landlocked. Force. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're defending. <laughs> you know, I, I thought of something the other day. Uh, it's called the Islamic State, right? That's what ISIS is, the Islamic uh, State. Uh, yeah, I, well, it's the state part that's bad, right? Yeah, it's not the Islamic <laughs> part. That's the trick they're all trying to play on us. They're all trying to play that it's the Islamic part that's bad about the Islamic State. No, it's the state. So when you spell Islamic State, capitalize all caps. The state part. Um, who was it? Um, Patrick Coburn, I think. Uh, or is it Cockburn? I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, he's, he's a writer from England, and he actually wrote a book called Living Under the Islamic State. Not a book. I think it's like a five-piece uh, thing of journalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically he makes the argument that it's a state now. You know, it, it should have borders that we see on a map. It's more of a state than Iraq the government from Baghdad is mm. uh, because the Islamic State is actually able to constri conscript soldiers. They've been able to, they've, they've got the populace so in fear, uh, at least the people that haven't run away uh, as refugees, mm -hmm. uh, so in fear that they're, they're pulling the firstborn sons uh, or the, the oldest son of every family and they're, they're making them part of the army of the Islamic State. Uh, and they're able to tax and shake people down. So they're going through, uh, I guess, um, the Americans have bombed a lot of their oil revenue uh, streams, you know, a lot of the refineries they had taken control of. Uh, so they've had to 
find other ways of funding themselves, and one of the ways they're doing it is through taxes. Um, so one of the ways the Islamic State is becoming more horrible and more powerful is doing the things that a state does and that states are known for, i.e. conscription and taxation. <laughs> you got to pay your taxes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, so, so 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 exactly. Tell me how how the Islamic State going around and shaking down businesses for money so they can fight Iraq is different than the American taxpayer tax collectors coming to you and shaking you down so they can take your money so they can fight Iraq. What's the difference? Our humans and our sand is better than your humans and your sand. So, so there. <laughs> That's all it boils down to. <laughs> That's a patriotism, right? Yeah, or yeah, nationalism. yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, so, so why don't you uh, uh, mention uh, how Anarchopulco went real quick, uh, so, so I don't want to keep you Oh, yeah. yeah. We got caught off in, in the high ideas, didn't we? <laughs> no I always do that. that. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, no, Anarchopulco uh, was amazing. I, I look back on it, and I'm like, did that really happen? Like, it was almost <laughs> dreamlike how great it was. Um, I mean, just everything. Uh, you go there, and it's it's this beautiful place full of magic and, and the ocean is amazing and it's in this beautiful bay to where uh it's either mountain or ocean you know there's like barely any in between i guess there's a beach as a buffer zone and a fun city you know there was nightlife i'm not really into that anymore because i i've been sober for two years so i don't do a lot of the drinking or any of the drinking really uh and i have kids so i'm not really a, a, a stay up late party kind of guy but i did stay up on the beach with uh the people that weren't out drinking and, and clubbing and just had amazing conversations with people from all over the world um, talking about the great ideas of liberty and the great applications of it. Uh, there was so many people that actually have already expatted that have moved out of the United States. Uh, I got to talk to Angel Clark um, and her male counterpart, Famous Dave, for, for quite a bit. Uh, they've recently relocated to Acapulco. And they, they tell me, you know, I just I can't imagine ever going back to the police state that is America. Once you leave, you kind of realize how bad it was. Hmm. Um, and I could kind of see what they were getting at, you know. Um, there are people uh, I talked to from Cambodia who just uh, were telling how great the business climate is there, that you literally need nothing to start a business other than the idea and the capital to get it going. You don't really need to beg for permission or pay off a regulator or, or anything like that. Um, and so it, it was a great melting pot of people making making freedom happen. Um, and the event itself was kind of like a proof of anarchic order. Uh, you know, there was really no leader. I mean, everybody says, oh, that's Jeff Berwick's thing. But um, Jeff kind of took a, a real hands-off approach. And he said as much, you know, in, in the conference room. He said, you know, this is really about you guys and the speakers. And, and there, were, there were some people who couldn't make it either because I think Cody Wilson didn't want to get caught at the border because he's got his project about the, the gun mill going on right now and he was worried about it. Uh, there are a few other people that couldn't make it. But the gaps were just kind of filled in on the spot anarchically. Like somebody would be like, oh, I have something to say. And, mm -hmm. and Jeff would be like, oh, yeah, have him talk about whatever his deal is. And they'd go up and talk about it. And, and um, everything just kind of happened. You know, with the music thing, it was, it was supposed to be me, uh, Rob Hustle, Tatiana Morose, and one other, L. Dixon. That was it. And L. Dixon didn't make it. Tatiana got sick. She, oh. she I guess, partied a little too hard. And she had a, a problem with her voice. So she couldn't even sing. She uh. could barely talk. And so she wasn't able to headline. But it was still so perfect. You know, we didn't plan. Me, me and Rob were just like, oh, let's do it like this. And so I, I went and did my set, which I had actually prepared. And it was a nice, well thought out um, set. And it was, you know, it was amazing. I'd never actually rapped to nothing but anarchists before, to where everybody <laughs> like totally agreed with everything I said. And we're like singing along. It was, it was, it was an amazing experience for me personally. Um, you know, and then everybody was totally stoked about it. The energy got really high. Um, and then Rob comes on. And the first thing Rob does is is completely, you know, in, in the spirit of liberty, says, "Hey, if you can rap, if you could spit, if you're a lyricist, come up on the stage. Let's all let's all form a cipher." So we formed a cipher. We, he made sure to pull Jeff Berwick up. Me, me and Rob <laughs> actually did plan on that. We were like, "We we got to get Jeff to rap, no matter what we do." <laughs> we, we even talked to Jeff. We're like, "We're gonna pull you up on stage, so you better have something." He's like, "I can't freestyle." We're like, "Doesn't matter. Rap something you used to rap from like ten years ago or twenty years ago or whatever." <laughs> and so, so even Jeff got in on the fun, and a bunch of other people came up and and had a good time, and um, and then and then Rob brought people in because you know his his big song is. Is uh, this is what happened when he called the cops, right? Everybody knows it went viral on YouTube. It's a great song. Uh, so he's got a sequel he's working on. 
uh, called Good Cops. And I don't want to give too much away, but it's, uh. it's a great track. And so he previewed that. And so he, he said, okay, this is my new track. It's a sequel to, to uh, This is What Happens When You Call the Cops. Everybody come up. And he had everybody come up, and we all circled around him. You know, almost all the audience that could fit on the stage uh, came up, and we all circled around him, and we all listened to it, and it, we were vibing. And then, you know, he was like, okay, now it's time for this is what happens when you call the cops. And did it, and we all sang along. It was, it was great. And, you know, I took a video of it. I posted it. Um, it. Just all the anarchists in Acapulco circled around Rob Hustle, all knowing the words, singing along to this is what happens when you call the cops. Uh, it, was a, it was a spontaneous um, explosion of lyrical beauty, and um, I, I don't know how else to describe it. It was it was amazing. Um, I'm actually working on a video right now. I can't put Rob's whole setup until he finishes his sequel, Good Cops, mm-hmm. uh, and then I'll put his stuff up too. But right now, I'm working on all my stuff. Um, James Corbett was kind enough to take a few different camera angles, and he, he sent me whatever he 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 captured. And um, Dan Dix also had like three different cameras recording i had my own static shot recording the whole thing so I, i'm just in the process right now of editing it all together and getting all the camera shots there in sync and ready to go and then i'll put it up on my youtube channel for those who aren't able to attend the anarcho poco musical extravaganza can actually witness it uh as the people there actually got to see it wow <laughs> what an experience oh my god Make yeah, me, it's make, a lot of fun. Make me jealous. <laughs> you should have gone, man. I know. Gone. Yeah, there, there were a lot of people naysaying it, and you know, I, okay, whatever. I, I can kind of see where you're coming from, but in the end, um, it was. I think it was way it went way better than than anybody kind of expected it to go, and uh, and it was it was kind of uh, an awesome, fun thing. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm still I'm still trying to get my wife to go to Porkfest. I've never been there. Um, so. I still haven't done that either. I still, I still have yet to do that. You know, some people were talking about that too, about how, you know, maybe it's kind of like a bell curve. Like something gets, something starts off and it's kind of really fun and it gets really popular. And then once it starts getting too crowded and cliche, it starts to, to get worse and worse. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't want to hate on pork fest and I've never been, but, um, but I think in the next few years going to an Arcopoco will be a kind of a fun thing if, if it continues yeah. because it'll, it'll get bigger and bigger. And it's kind of on the new edge of, of, uh, of things. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Sounds cool. So, uh, so why don't you let people know where they can find your work? Uh, just, just Google me. I, I think I'm the only Nima Vidati that exists. Uh, so just look <laughs> at <laughs> look, look look at uh, Danilo's um, show notes page for this episode, and you can find my name and spell it. Just throw that in Google. Um, you can find me on Facebook. I, I, I like to argue with a lot of people on Facebook. It's just Nima Vidati, N E E M A. V E D A D I. Uh, you find me on Twitter. Same thing. Nima V. No, Nima Vidati. It's yeah, my whole name. On YouTube, I'm the Nima V. Uh, and there's a lot of a lot of my music videos on YouTube. Um, you can go to freedomfiends.com. I, I uh, started that with Michael Dean, and uh, there's archives of me doing talk radio for about three years. Uh, I think I left April of last year. Um, so there's tons of content of me talking there about various issues. Um, and then I appear occasionally on, on other people's shows, like, uh, people who are kind enough to have me like the one I'm doing now. Uh, and I was on Ernie Hancock's show last week. So just Google me and you see whatever I've been up to. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, definitely put all, all those, uh, in the, in the description, um, and the two videos, uh, gun for everyone and, um, uh, see my, see my chains. chains, see my chains. Yeah. Um, all right, so thank you very much, Nima. Awesome conversation, as always. Um, so, if uh, if anybody is is willing to uh, support the show in any capacity, uh, we accept PayPal and Bitcoin. Uh, uh, the uh, the links are in the um, in the description box. Any help is much appreciated. Uh, spreading liberty is not easy, but we do it anyway because we are wonderful people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. We do what we can, you know, because. Uh, you know, like you only live once, and um, you know you want to make the most of it. And sleep is annoying because you gotta—it's it's a period of inactivity, and I just hate it. But <laughs> you gotta <laughs> sleep sometimes, right? <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, awesome conversation. So this is um, peaceful anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network, and the um, the conscious resistance. Uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>